Welcome to a special episode of the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me from the floor of the 2019 New York International Auto Show is senior editor John Belt Snyder from the Javits Hello. Center. How you doing, man? I'm good. It's uh, hustling and bustling here. Um, it's day two, so there's, there's still a lot going on. Um, if you hear some background noise, don't worry. They're just wheeling around equipment, cameras, <laughs> stage equipment. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty good. Pretty good show. New York is one of the busier, I think more interesting, more cosmopolitan shows that you'll, you'll go to. Uh, so definitely even on day two of the press days, which sometimes could be a little bit tamer. And it sounds like that's the case this year. There's still a lot going on. So, uh, yeah. so it sounds pretty cool. Yeah. There's a lot of people, a lot of people, um, you know, shooting video and stuff today. Cool. Yesterday was full, full of press conferences. Cool. Cool. So listeners, uh, please bear with us, but, uh, we thought you'd kind of like it if we had somebody live from the floor like this, right by all the new, uh, the new sheet metal and all the people, the executives, the, you know, the dogs, there's always a lot of security dogs there. There are. Uh, cool. All right. So how about we, uh, we'll start things off with the winners. Uh, this is the auto blog editor's choice just tabulated. And, uh, then we'll just break them down and talk about some of the, uh, you know, the other things, observations from the show. Yeah. I'm excited to hear what won. Cool. So jo John is learning these just for the first time. He's a voter of course, but, uh, yeah. he's actually, uh, going to hear the news right now. So in first place with a very, uh, strong total here of 49 votes, the Lincoln Corsair. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Second place. Well, here, I'll, I'll run through them, John, then uh, let's sure. hear what you think here. Second place is the Genesis Mint, 39 points. Tied for third is the Kia Habanero and the Subaru Outback with 35 okay. points. And then uh, rounding out the field here is the Cadillac CT5 with 19 points. So, okay. um, yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah, all very different vehicles all over the, all over the board there. Um, you know, I'm not too surprised that the Lincoln Corsair won. That, uh, you know, I'm seeing it in person. It's really nice. It looks like the Aviator uh, shrunken down just a little bit. Similar proportions, really nice interior. Um, I, I was really pleased with it. Uh, you know, it's got that, um, based on the Escape, and it's got a, a higher performance version of, of, of that engine. Um, I think that that could be a good car. Uh, I was definitely taken to it. And, of course, Lincoln's just been killing it lately with uh, interiors with exterior colors and, um, yeah, with, with the naming now. So, uh, I'm, I'm not super surprised about that one. I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited. I like the name big time. I think it's great how Lincoln has transitioned back to these, you know, actual names of cars. Lincoln's got yeah. a great history. Um, Corsair, I believe is a world war II fighter plane, if I'm remembering correctly. And it just, it rolls off the tongue really well. It sounds good. The vehicle looks great. It's, um, yeah. I think it's definitely a, a smart, uh, segment for them to play in. They're doing things that I think in some ways Cadillac, you know, isn't, it probably should be doing, you know, Lincoln is really loading up on the crossovers and the Corsair is, you know, another one. And this is for those of you that don't follow all these names and, you know, the nomenclature, this is the next version of what was the MKC. That's correct. And it, it was it's kind of interesting because the the Lincoln uh, booth is is very uh, close in proximity to the Cadillac booth, and so uh, it, you you could really see the differences in, in the the Cadillacs. And you look at the interiors and the and the pricing, and then you go over to Lincoln, you look at the interiors and the pricing, and and the Lincolns are just, in my opinion, much more attractive uh, based on on those values. Cool. So let's move on to second place, which uh, was, I wasn't surprised this was in second, but uh, I guess I was a little bit surprised. 39 points for the Genesis Mint. By all the Genesis lineup. But it looks really good in person. Um, I love the the, the doors, uh, the sort of sleek profile. It sort of reminds me of like a smart electric drive for the wealthy or, um, yeah, I mean, sort of urban runabout uh, 
And uh, Manfred Fitzgerald, executive VP at Genesis, is really fighting hard for this. He's, he's talked to both me and, and Joel Stocksdale about uh, how he really wants this to become something. Um, maybe, maybe if not the, the mint, then uh, you know, some sort of sleek EV uh, in the near future for Genesis. So I, I think that's a, a well-deserving second place. I uh, am pretty excited about this and what this could do for Genesis. I really love the name Mint. I It's just such yeah. a random name to have. Uh, n- every name, it seems like, for a car is named after some plane, some, you know, it's alphanumeric. It's, there's basically a playbook on how to name a car. And mm-hmm. Mint is pretty random. I realize it's a concept and that's kind of, you know, how you name a concept is a weird way. But... Um, yeah, so I, I like it too. I think it's cool. I hope they find a way to do it. And that's some great reporting on you know the part of yourself there, John. And shout out to uh, Joel uh, for talking there with Manf- Manfred Fitzgerald uh, about the details. Because I think um, you know a lot of people have a lot of questions about you know this car and what could become of it. And let's yeah. hope they do it. I mean, Genesis, yeah. it's, it's pretty slick looking. It really is. Fingers crossed. I think, I think electric future for Genesis is... Is a good thing. Agreed. Totally. Um, okay. So for third place, we have a tie and this is uh-huh. interesting. So we'll, they both got 35 points, but let's start with the Kia Habanero. Habanero, yeah. 35 points. Yeah. So this was a little more low key, um, but still, you know, impressive. It's an all electric uh, sort of riff on the, on the Nero. Um, this one's a little more uh, off-roady, got some bigger tires, um, sort of really futuristic looking interior. I wasn't super overwhelmed by it, but I like the, the concept of the concept. And um, I love what, what Kia is doing with their EVs right now. Um, you know, this is right next to the Nero EV and the Soul EV uh, on the show floor. And um, yeah, those are both, both great cars and... Uh, I'm glad to see them playing with the idea of the Nero EV and uh, thinking of other things that they can do with it. Those doors are awesome. I think that's yeah. uh, that's a great design touch. And what I like about Kia is they really go for it with their concept cars. They don't hold mm-hmm. anything back. They're crazy. And the whole point of concept cars are to sort of tease what could happen, uh, what directions they might go, and to basically kind of get people excited about your brand. And Kia is excellent at doing that. I think that's, that's really a good thing that they do that's critical. Sometimes you see concept cars and you're like, oh, okay, well, take the, you know, the, the wheels off and take off some of that trim. And it, that's the car, the production car. Whereas Kia, you know, whatever they end up doing with this, it's probably not going to have those crazy doors and some right. of those creases and angles. But I think that's cool. I, I voted for this. I was excited about it. Um, that lighting is crazy. Uh, I, it's wild. I think it, they could do a lot of things yeah. with this concept. So, so we'll see. Yeah. I mean, they, they could do a lot of things with, with EVs in general and, um, to sort of branch out from like the, the straightforward commuter crossover, I think is a good thing for them. So also tied for third place, we, you know, kind of the opposite of a crazy crossover is the <laughs> production ready 2020 Subaru Outback. Uh, a lot of us like that. We're all pretty, um, you know, pretty big Subaru fans in many respects. Um, this one, I think the design is a pretty big departure of what the Outback has been. Um, well, I wouldn't say big departure, but I think it brings it more in line with the current styling that you're seeing from like the Forester, from the Crosstrek, the Legacy. Um, it just, it makes it look more like the family of Subaru, if you will. Yeah. I, I, you know, when I was approaching it from, from a distance, I was kind of surprised at how similar it looked to the previous version, which is something they sort of did with, with the Forester. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Subaru's got loyal fans. They don't want to mess with anything too much. Uh, but then as, as you get closer and you start walking around the car, you see lots of little details that are different. And then once you open it up on the inside, it's a lot different, especially the, the infotainment. It's got sort of a vertical um, tablet style uh, infotainment screen, which is, um, looks really useful. A lot of nice details inside. Uh, great big cup holders. Looks like it might be able to accommodate an algae. We'll see. Um, <laughs> Can't wait to get one of those in the fleet to test it yeah. out on video, of course. 
Right. I, I forgot to bring my Nalgene to the show. Um, John is the star of our Nalgene <laughs> series. It's a social <laughs> exclusive series that he does generally on his Twitter handle, which Autoblog retweets, and he tests Nalgene's uh, on all of our press cards. I love 32-ounce Nalgene, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you got to have a lot of water. John's got quite the commute. Sometimes it's an hour plus to get from Autoblog back home, so you got to have that Nalgene. I'm a very thirsty man. But yeah, the... the the, I like the lighting on the Outback and the rear lighting. I like the, um, there, there seemed to be a little more plastic cladding on it. I really like, there was some interesting geometry of the plastic cladding underneath the, the side sills on, on going down the side of the car. Um, but overall, you know, it, it still looks like a, like an Outback. Uh, but yeah, just improved, uh, in all the ways that'll make it, you know, more pleasing to the current customers, I feel like. They'll, they'll be happy to remain in a Subaru. I think it gets a little bit more, a slight more car vibe than the current Outback has. It's just, to me, that's, maybe it's the proportions. It's like the way the hood sort of looks. There's, there's some more curves in the back fenders. It's very subtle, and it's totally my perception. But I actually sort of feel like the current Outback has really it's gone into this like kind of blocky thing. And I don't know. I like the, you know, maybe the 2010 era outback more than I like the current styling. So yeah. I kind of like what, where this could be going. So uh -huh. I'm excited. The XT trim 260 horsepower, really excited yeah. about that. We get, we, we get a turbocharged engine engine again, which is really nice. Um, I wish they would do that with, uh, I really miss it in the Forester. Uh, but yeah, glad to see a, a turbo again. Very cool. And, uh, you know, like to your earlier point, the interiors of Subarus have been going up, I think in the last, well, the last decade or so, yeah. um, we're seeing better materials. Uh, I think just the, the use of those better materials is a little more creative, a little more holistic. Uh, you've gone, gone on a few Subaru test drives recently for us and, yeah, it just seems like you always come back. And even like in our conversations across the, you know, our desks here in Detroit, like, oh, wow, I just got a, got out of XYZ Subaru. I really like this interior. I was so surprised. You know, it's almost like, yeah. it's like Mad Libs. Like we still are kind of, you know, sticking to this like preconceived notion that, you know, some of the Subaru interiors are kind of rough, kind of cheap, but really they're, they're moving up the food chain. Mm -hmm. They are. And, and they're, they're, uh, putting more technology, more convenience technology inside the cars too, which which makes uh, li living inside of it nicer. Um, you know, the platforms are becoming quieter, uh, road noise is less of an issue. Um, I'm excited to see how the Outback evolves in terms of uh, NVH and, and comfort, and, uh, yeah, living with it uh, day to day, you know, on, on the highway and, and throughout town. Then that brings us to our fifth place winner. That is the uh, Cadillac CT5. This is a uh, mm -hmm. pretty good looking sports sedan. Everybody else is saying, hey, crossover, crossover. Cadillac's like, well, hey, we want to sell you sports sedans. And yeah. as enthusiasts, I think that's awesome. As maybe armchair macro economists, I don't know if this is the right play for them, but hey, you know, more power to them. <laughs> they're doing it. <laughs> they're, they're, they're certainly doing it. And they're sticking with the the uh alphanumeric naming um but you know i i sort of slept on this this car for the show I, I i sort of didn't you know it didn't draw me in um seeing it in photos but then when i walked by it in person um i was i was really taken by the silhouette and uh, just the the sort of yeah it, it definitely looks more sporty less blocky more curvy um Definitely, definitely, yeah, really attractive. And and there was this one with this like deep burgundy paint color that was absolutely gorgeous. So I I'm uh, I'm sort of coming around to that car. Uh, uh, I'll have to spend some more time with it. Uh, but yeah, uh, that one was sort of the 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 dark horse for me. I think. Um for one thing, they essentially revealed this car um, before the show. So I, mm -hmm. I see where you're coming from and the fact that, you know, they, I mean, they did like, you know, you might call like the online reveal ahead of time. And it just seemed like 
Yeah, maybe it got a little overshadowed at the show, and that's you know perhaps why maybe it didn't get as many votes as we normally might have given a car like that. Although other cars did that too, so you know yeah. it is what it is. I think um, this might sound strange, but I actually have generally thought that Cadillac's alphanumeric system has generally worked in a way that Lincoln's okay. never quite did. It's random, <laughs> and I think it's and this is my own opinion here, but I think. Lincoln going back to names makes more sense. They've yeah. chosen wisely. They already had Navigator. And then you could sort of see when they rolled out um, Continental that they were probably going to start going back. And it was just a matter of time for when they started knocking off, you know, some of these other models. In Aviator, Nautilus, they've all filled in nicely. Corsair, I mean, to me, that's a great lineup of cars right now, vehicles. It sure is. And then you've got the, you know, the Cadillac lineup. They still have the Escalade. Um and, you know, they're tweaking their alphanumeric lineup. So CTS, mm -hmm. ATS, now we've got CT5. Okay. Yeah. All right. You know, maybe a CT4, CT6 is already a thing. It's, I think it rolls off the tongue pretty well. It's just, it's a little confusing now as to what's what. So. Yeah. So I, f I feel like I've always been able to keep Cadillac's uh, nomenclature in my head, uh, organized a little better than, than uh, the previous Lincoln uh language but um but now that's starting to fall apart a little bit as they add more uh new new cars to the lineup the it, it's it's starting to it's starting to fall apart for me like, i just can't remember them quite as quickly and easy, easily as i could before um maybe i'm just getting old <laughs> but i th i think it is part partly just they keep adding stuff to the lineup well we're all getting old but um you know <laughs> so i think it's um yeah, I think I think the CT uh, the CT five is going to probably do pretty well for them, but I don't think it's going to be a transformational vehicle unless something changes in the industry. Yeah, so for sure. It maybe maybe things will, but I mean, right now they're fighting like a zero sum game with like you know BMW, Mercedes, Audi, uh, you know, in the sports sedan segment, but nobody else is really there, you know. So it's like they're making they're making like this amazing vehicle that. Air, we think it'll be amazing. The CTS is very good. The ATS is very good. And it's sort of like, you know, they're making the best horse as opposed to like the best car or something, you know? I don't uh -huh. know. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so so those are the winners. Um, pretty good roundup of, uh, of, you know, what Autoblog did this year. I think it's, um, I think, you know, the New York show was strong. I think it's, in you know, in light of other, and you tell me if I'm wrong here, but in light of just the like changing, you know, like the ground shifting underneath auto shows, it seems like the New York show really held serve this year. Nothing mind blowing, but a, a lot of decent concepts, some important reveals. Uh, but what are your impressions? Yeah, it's, I, I, you, you summed it up pretty well right there. I mean, it was it wasn't anything crazy, um, but yeah, it felt like a really solid show that. Uh, uh, in terms of auto shows, like <laughs> thriving or dying, this one feels like it's chugging along. You know, it's it, it's it's working, it's uh, doing its job, and uh, you know, it's a really good it's a really good show all in all. Uh, a little a uh, little bit calm, not not crazy, uh, which makes it easier to to cover and to <laughs> you know dive deep into some of these these cool cars. Cool. So let's, um, while we've got a little bit of time left, let's talk about some of the non-winning but still pretty important uh, vehicles. The Hyundai mm -hmm. Venue is very important for Hyundai. Um, one of our contributors, Joe Lorio, actually got a very short uh, drive in it, if you check that out on our website. Uh, what were your impressions of the Venue? I really liked it. Uh, it, it was super cute. Um, I it, it sort of feels like a like a mini countryman or something to me, um, with that you know two tone like the white top, uh, the one that's on the show floor here. Um, really cool uh, exterior design elements. The interior is pretty nice. Uh, actually, kind of a lot of space in the back. Uh, it's not super uh, long the the cargo area, but it's it's deep. It, uh, you know, it's got this deep sort of cargo well. And it looks like a really usable cargo space, and uh, in, in sort of this tight package of a, of a cute car that looks like you know not a bad place to spend time. Um, 
I, I would love to drive one. And um, yeah, I, I really like that sort of tiny, tiny <laughs> sort of crossover-ish segment. I think it's a good place to play right now for, you know, automakers of all stripes because, you know, consumers have said, you know, they voted with their pocketbooks. They like crossovers and not mm -hmm. everybody needs a really big one. So I think this is a smart addition to their lineup. Uh, I really like the name, but it's a little confusing to me. And, yeah. you know, I should preface this by saying, as all of my opinions about names, sometimes my opinions are totally random, like the Lincoln <laughs> and Cadillac scenario. But when I think venue, I think like three row crossover, like a venue is like a theater or a stadium. A space. Yeah, yeah. It's not the smallest crossover they make. <laughs> so, so I don't know about that one, but I guess like, you know, like we were saying earlier, you got to name it something. Um, yeah. So, Hey, and, and they've been, they've been sticking with, you know, the names of, of cities for, for such a long time that, uh, it's good to see them, uh, you know, of places. It's good to see them sort of move away from that and try something new. Yeah, that makes, I mean, that makes sense, I think. Uh, speaking of crossovers, this one is appropriately named and uh, it fits its size, the Toyota Highlander. That, mm -hmm. uh, that was new this year uh, in New York. Uh, I think it looks okay. Um, you're obviously a lot closer to it than I am. It seemed like this was a very evolutionary uh, update. Yeah, I mean, what you see in the photos is, is pretty much what you see in person. This is one that, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's not a big step forward. Um, it seems like the quality is a little higher. Uh, it, and I don't know if it's just, if it's just me. Uh, I didn't get out the, the tape measure or look up the, the, the dimensions, but it, it, looks, it looks a little bigger than it, than it was before. Um, I don't know if it actually is. It, it might just be sort of slightly more imposing. But, um, yeah, very soft features. Uh, Nothing too striking about it, but you know, uh, I'm sure it'll it'll sell just fine for Toyota. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's an important segment for them. It's a money maker. I am a little mixed on these looks. I'm, you know, again, I'm not in New York, and you are. Um, I don't know. It feels like they got a little cuter with this than they needed to. Um, yeah. I'll have to wait till it's on the road. I think of the Highlander as being more of a really buttoned up kind of thing, and it seems like. Looking at some of these curves and like the taillights, they look a little weird to me, even though I do like the Highlander and I'm pretty sure I'll like this one. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's my yeah. take. I mean, I think, I think what you're seeing is, is pretty much what you, what you get. Um, I think your analysis is, is pretty spot on. That's, that's, you basically described this car perfectly. There, there we go. Other things, Mercedes GLS 911 Speedster from Porsche. Uh, uh huh. Cool vehicles. Um, yeah. yeah, either of those strike your fancy? Yeah, both of them. Um, the GLS, uh, I already like the GLS, but glad to see it being updated. The interior is absolutely gorgeous. Um, love what they're doing with their MBUX infotainment system. Uh, I think they even made this one a little bit bigger, which is you know, hard to do because it's already massive. But, um, but the last one drove pretty well. Um, so I'm excited to get into that one. Um, as for the Porsche Speedster, I am deeply in love with that car. Uh, it's got the GT3 engine, the naturally aspirated, um, limited to 1,948, uh, units. Um, so very exclusive. Uh, that's worldwide. Uh, it's very exclusive. Uh, the, they have a design, uh, a heritage design package, which has, you know, gumball graphics and, and some other cool uh, design touches that harken back to Porsche's past. And then uh, exclusive for buyers of this car, of this $275,000 car, you can also buy, if you want to, uh, a Porsche Speedster watch. Um, they, they have one that's, uh, you know, it, it sort of copies the dials from and, and different design elements from the Speedster. And then the, they also have a Heritage Edition watch for to represent the Heritage Edition Speedster. So, uh, yeah, that car is really, really nice. Um, I, this, everything about it, you know, it's, 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 it's not my favorite, uh, you know, Porsche ever, but it's up there. It's, it's, it's a lovely, lovely car. Uh, 
everything's very lightweight. There's so much carbon fiber in this thing that, that you can't see. Um, but uh, it's all painted over. Um, but it's, it's got the you know nylon door door strap poles instead of a normal handle. Um, things like that. It's got these little touches, these purest lightweight uh, touches. I think this one will be an instant instant collector, um, especially since it's you know going to be so exclusive. I think uh, anytime you do a special edition 911, it really gets you know you know our pulses quickened, if you will. Uh, I really like that watch. I was surprised actually when I looked at it. <laughs> usually, like car maker watch collaborations, special editions, they're usually pretty tacky. But uh, mm-hmm. this one's just like it's you know basically all gray and black, kind of gunmetal. It you know like you said, it mimics the like the the dials inside the car. Uh, looks like a rubber band. No, it's a leather strap i'm sorry yeah um, it's so it's, it's cool actual like the same the same leather and stitching uh materials that they use inside the interior of of the car itself <laughs> that being said i don't know if i'd want to be the guy who has a 911 speedster and a matching watch i don't know yeah, i mean i just i feel like i'd rather like just like not be quite that you know b- brand centric i don't know but it's like the it's like the person that wears the band's t-shirt to the show. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, but it's pretty cool uh, in many different ways. Maybe just not together. I don't know. Yeah. But very, uh, very excited car. Uh, the one that you could see in the pictures on Autoblog. Also, by the time you're listening to this, all of our galleries are up. Our ace uh, photographer, Drew Phillips, was prowling the floor. His mega gallery is incredible. I've seen it. So you got to check that out. And pictures of this car are certainly there too. And I really love that color. That is a great shade of red on that Porsche. Yeah, it's, it's nice. It, it definitely looks uh, very Porsche. The very Porsche color. And good wheels too. I'll, I'll give uh, credit to brands like Porsche does this a lot. Sometimes Jeep does this too. A bit of a flashy color, like for the you know the body, and then the wheels are like gray or black or matte or something. So, like, in this case, bright red Porsche and then kind of gunmetal wheels. It's a great look. I I really enjoy that. I think that's cool. Yeah, I do, too. And I, I've walked by it a million times on the stand already. I, I just keep getting drawn back to it. All righty. So, any final thoughts from the floor in New York there, John? What uh, Whatever we talked about, any surprises, anything that regardless of how the votes fell, you think is underrated or overrated. Uh, what do you think there, man in the field? Well, it's, it's interesting. They, they did the World Car of the Year awards and just to see how well the Jaguar I-Pace did. Um, and then getting to see uh, some of these cars that I've, I've been wanting to see, like the Suzuki Jimny. They have one down in the basement near the, near the press room just randomly. <laughs> and then, you know, Koenigsegg's here. Um, there's a Chantu uh k50 all electric car that's going to be uh, from china that's going to be sold here eventually um it's actually pretty pretty striking um a little bit polarizing design and who knows what's going to happen with that with that company it could be vaporware maybe not um got to see rivian uh up close uh you know we've seen those already but but they're here they're on the they're on the show floor they're they're right next to mercedes between mercedes and audi um, that's unbelievable what do you think about yeah. it yeah so it's, so things like that are, are, are pretty interesting to me just to walk the floor and see and see that sort of stuff uh, and you know we talked about the subaru outback subaru usually has very sort of plain setups their 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 stand this year is is all like the car it, it's uh national park theme so there's uh you know, the the carpet is like leaves <laughs> and you know there's waterfall sounds and stuff it's it pretty wild uh interesting to see subaru uh go whole hog on that uh but all in all yeah a really good show solid show um yeah yeah i i i this is my first time at the new york show i've been to the javits center before um, uh, but it was definitely uh, a different feel with all these cars on the floor and the, you know, all these automakers putting their best foot forward. I made it nine straight years. So, uh, I guess you kind of took my place this year. That's okay. Uh, but it's, I always like the New York auto show. They do a really good job as far as just, uh, bringing a lot of different brands together. I would compare it in some ways to how 
the Geneva Motor Show is sort of neutral turf. Like all the European car companies and sometimes the Americans of the Japanese show up, but nobody is based in Switzerland. So it's like very much neutral right. turf. I think you get that feel in at the New York show. Uh, everybody wants to put their best foot forward. Obviously, it's not as big or as prestigious as, say, you know, Geneva or Detroit or, you know, other right. shows. But I, that's the same vibe. And I really like that about New York, plus springtime in New York. What's not to like? Yeah, it's, it's been we've had pretty gorgeous weather. Um, it's, it's a little cloudy today, but the past couple of days have been really nice. Uh, but yeah, it, it's 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 not biased toward any one region or brand or market, really. Um, it's everything's here, you know, every, uh, everyone's represented and um, that makes it fun. Mustang performance pack, high performance pack. Last thing before we let you go, that was something sure. we missed earlier. Uh, we heard rumors about this. We talked about this on the podcast last week. Now we know what it is. Do you think it uh, measures up? It's what we hope for. Well, it depends on the price, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I, I got a good look at it. It's, uh, the visual touches are really cool. Um, you know, the, the, the hood, it's got these like decals that sort of fade uh, that follow the contours of the hood. It's got these beautiful 19-inch wheels. Uh, it's got these little 2.3-liter uh, high-performance badges. Um, yeah, just a really sort of interesting uh, uh, look. Uh, I, I think that uh, it does service, they needed to do something good for, for the EcoBoost Mustang. Uh, but that said, you know, if, it, if we're pushing, you know, GT territory, I'm going to go with the GT all day. I don't care if the, <laughs> if the EcoBoost handles better. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you. 5.0 with the manual. I, just, I think that is one of the better, like, you know, pairings of any sort of sports cars you could get. So to me, yeah. it's like, it's not perfect, but it does exactly what is an enthusiast you want it to do. It's a Mustang. And to me, anything else is just like you're giving something up. So yeah. um, I would go that way, but not everybody thinks that way. So I think it's, <laughs> it's smart for them to continue to iterate and offer things at different, you know, performance levels, different sort of combinations of things. It, like, like you said, it all is going to come down to the price. Yeah. And well, you know, it's, it's uh, supposedly it sounds really good too. I haven't heard it, but um, yeah, reports from others who have seen it. You know, uh, I was talking to Joel Stocksdale, and he said it just sounds really, really gnarly too. So that's cool. Um, that that could be a, a draw right there uh, it, with the Focus RS engine. Give it that that crackly sound. That might do it. That might do it for me. Very interesting. Very interesting, and we'll have to leave it there. John has a plane to catch. Somehow he is going to be in, uh, in Detroit with me tomorrow. So he, <laughs> uh, you know, we got to let him go. He's got to get his shuttle to the airport. Uh, thanks for listening this week. Uh, apologize for the ambient noise out of Javits Center in New York. But we did want to bring you this special, um, I would call it live, but it's on location uh, at the 2019 New York Auto Show. John, safe travels. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. This has been a great show, and uh, it's always nice to wrap it up with you. All right. So, uh, hope you enjoy this week's show. Uh, send us your Spend My Monies. We'll get back to those next week and in the coming weeks. Uh, send us your email. Send us your feedback. Be safe out there. We'll see you next time.